All right, today we have Russell Hallbrook joining the Spin Zone for you old school tooth and nail music listeners. You know who I'm talking about when I say Joe Christmas. Uh, we do a lot of reminiscing about the band and the beginning stages, Cornerstone 91 and 93. Uh, their buddies in the band Luxury, why they didn't come out with a third album, uh, the chances of Joe Christmas coming out with a third album, just lots of fun memories of in what I what I call the golden age of, of Christian music and uh, getting a behind the scenes look at one of the most important tooth and nail bands, Joe Christmas. Here's my friend Russell Holbrook. Yep. Yep, so we do a lot of music uh, kind of stuff like this. Um, I don't know if you remember Craig's brother, but the the punk band Craig's brother that was on Tooth and Nail, we did an interview with uh, Ted from that band on Bad Christian, and I think I'm going to get him on the Spin Zone uh, to talk about some stuff that we didn't have time to talk about, similar to what I'm doing with you, man. Um well, let, uh, am I correct that it's August of 1995 when Upstairs Overlooking came out? Uh, That's about around right. Around there. I think yeah. it, was, it was June, I June. think. Gotcha. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, what... I mean, the music industry was so different back then. I mean, people actually went out and bought CDs and looked through the artwork and... We, I mean, we were joking around the other day how I used to make sure the band, or I wanted to see if the band thanked God because it made me feel good. <laughs> I was like, yes, this band not only sounds good, but they thank God. I mean, it's just like a totally different season of listening to music. What was it like for you guys? Like, can can you put your mind back there? It's, it's release day, and y'all have an album that's coming out on Tooth & Nail. Was that like a really big deal at the time? Oh, yeah. It was a huge deal. Uh, can you hear me well enough? Yep, 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 yep. All right, cool. Yeah, it was a really big deal. I remember the day that the CDs arrived, they were mailed to Ryan's house. Yeah, Ryan yeah. Weaver, the bass player. Yeah, yeah. And I was at Zach's house, and we were going to go swimming. And, like, they were, like, Ryan and his brother Josh were so excited they just like drove over to Zach's and they weren't even dressed. They like showed up in their boxers with the boxes, <laughs> the box of CDs. And like, um, so we got them before they came out in the store and it was just like really incredible to see it shrink wrapped and then to yeah. unwrap the CD and hold That's, it, you know? And, yeah. Yep. Oh, it was just pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 It's, it's cool to hear, like the actual band's perspective and then to think of myself and how excited I was to go to my little college uh, mailbox and open up and get that uh, envelope from Tooth and Nail, open it up and get the Joe Christmas CD. It's, it's, it's interesting because when I think back on, like my brother and I, we listened to, I don't know, I'd love, I should do some research and see probably the first 100 releases of Tooth and Nail. We just bought it. I mean, no questions asked. If Tooth and Nail put an album out, we bought it because we trusted the label and we didn't know what else to buy because we were kind of locked into the Christian music industry based on my parents' limitations of what we could consume and all of that. And so, uh, you know, we, we would buy every single album. When when I listen to Joe Christmas, it's interesting. It's like you had, uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm talking from the perspective of my 1995 version, but you had cool Christian bands and then you had cool Christian bands that made Christian music look cool. And Joe Christmas, (laughs) Joe Christmas occupied some territory of it's like, you are proud to listen to this in your car and tell your friends this stuff. Hey, this is on a Christian label or these guys are Christians. It's like this credibility because I don't know what the music that y'all were making. Did did you recognize the unique space that you guys were occupying? You know, and and even if y'all didn't consider yourself a Christian band or on a Christian label, there still was mostly Christians consuming the product. I'd assume. Uh, yeah, I'm. I uh, not really. I mean, I don't think that we were that self aware. Yeah, yeah. As, um, but I do remember that. Uh, 
like we um, <clears throat> wanted to, how, I don't know, it's kind of hard to articulate it because like we, I remember when, for example, people started calling us an indie rock band. Yeah, and yeah. That hadn't really occurred to us before because we didn't really like label ourselves or anything, especially not uh, when we started. And um, I don't think we were that aware of it because yeah, we were yeah. looking at other people around us and we thought, like I remember thinking um, when the first Starflyer album came out, I thought, yeah, yeah. "Wow, this is this is a real band. Like you can't just say this is a Christian band. This is like a group of people trying to like com- use their music to gain to like win converts to the to right, Christianity. Right. Like this is just a band, you know, and it's a good band, and this record." you know, fucking kills and it's uh and uh so I remember like to me like they were cool. Right, but I right. never thought like we're cool. Cause wherever <laughs> we wherever we went, I always just felt kinda like the goofy outsider. There was but there was one time when we played a show, I think I was seventeen and we were still called Crayon and we played at this local like all ages place. Yeah, it was yeah. actually in a town, a town like a few miles from here, where we didn't know anybody. But remember, we got there late, and they kind of thought we weren't coming. And I remember walking in, carrying my guitar, and this really cute girl goes, "Oh, they're so cool!" Like when we <laughs> walked by, that was a really awesome moment. But like, you were like, "Oh my gosh, this is unreal." <laughs> So were were you guys tooth and nail? It, it sounds like y'all were tooth and nail fans before getting on the label. Like how did how did you guys connect to to tooth and nail? Like were y'all listening to Wish for Eden and Plank Eye and Starflyer and all that, and just sent a demo in, or did Brandon discover you guys, or what? No, like we were uh, fans of some of the music because I remember in a before we got signed, I was. Uh, a friend of mine used to go to the the Christian bookstore at the mall in yeah, Macon, yeah. in Macon, Georgia, where I was living and going to school. We would yeah, go there yeah. and, and steal tooth and nail cassettes from the Christian <laughs> bookstore. <laughs> <And> <laughs> that's that's how I got Starfire and MXPX. Oh, that's great. That's, I used to work at family Christian stores, and people would come in and steal Bibles. So you're not that bad. <laughs> They, we literally had to start taking the Bibles to the back storage and just have the boxes up front because people were stealing them so much. I'm like, do you not feel guilty every time you open up the Bible and read it knowing it's stolen? <laughs> I never would have thought that. Cause I felt kind of bad about stealing the tapes, but it was just so fun. Yeah, yeah. But, I don't know. but So we knew about the label, and um, Zach and I found out about Tooth & Nail when in 19, the summer of 93, we went to Cornerstone with our friends in a band called Luxury. But you know okay, Luxury. Okay. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah we, oh, yeah. like, rode up there with uh, another friend of ours, David Vanderpool. And I think it was kind of a caravan kind of deal. And Zach was in another band called the Sanctified Glory Mountain Revival Family. Wow, and it wow. was, like, the spinal tap of, like, gospel like bluegrass gospel it was just a a parody but people a lot of people thought they were serious but it was like (laughs) really hilarious so i think that was the year they played and then luxury played and we were like hanging out with the luxury guys when they got signed and um that's right because they're from are they from atlanta also they they were from tacoa which is above atlanta okay okay um but we used to play with them a lot. Like when we were in high school, we used to open for them at the local clubs. And like, we played the Sama Reptile with them and the Miracle Theater and the Pterodactyl and the Strand. And, um, yeah, they were, that's where we like discovered tooth and nail was like, we went at, was it Cornerstone that year? And I think that, 
Yeah, that was the year I saw Wish for Eden. That was the first show I saw of Cornerstone 93 was Wish for Eden. Wow. Yeah. Dude, it's so crazy. My brother and I, we just miss in what I call the glory days of 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 Christian music because we went to Cornerstone 91. So I was a freshman in high school. My brother was a junior and my dad and mom made the plans for my dad to take us. And it was like a really big deal, pretty expensive trip traveling and all that stuff. And, Oh, we missed all the, in my, I mean, we, we got some good stuff, but it was like the latter. It was, we we're still kind of in the hair metal, uh, days. And it's like all the cool stuff with wish for Eden and you guys and tooth and nail and all that stuff started happening just a couple of years afterwards. So y'all, y'all are at Cornerstone digging all this music and everything at the time. What was, uh, and, and obviously there's different band members, but like, were you kind of, what were you guys listening to? I mean, cause I, I listen to, you know, Joe Christmas and I'm picking up Dino, a lot of Dinosaur Jr. influence and stuff. Were y'all listening to a lot of stuff like that? Or what, what was y'all's, con- what were y'all consuming music wise? Yes. By the time the band became Joe Christmas, lots of Dinosaur Jr. and Sebado and Pavement. Yeah. And like pretty much anything that came out on Matador or Merge Records. And then like I've, like I was always listening to Starfire, yeah. And um, before that, like, cause uh, Zach and Ryan and I were also at Cornerstone '91. Were you yeah, really? Uh, yeah, like their youth pastor drove us there in the church van. Gosh. <laughs> and um, so that when we were there, like I was. All I listened to was Christian music, and my favorite bands were like Believer and The Crucified and Crash oh, yeah. Doll. Oh, yeah. And, but then Zach and Ryan were really into the choir and the Lost Dogs. Yeah, and, Michael Knott and all that. Yeah, that my, yeah all yeah. of that stuff. And so like we like came together, and our our interests like mixed and blended, and like um, uh they introduced like they got me to to listen to the throws oh yeah it's kind of like uh you know it's oh. like a rem sort of sounding yep. Yep. jangly type stuff and then so then after that i started to get more into that and i was in a met like so in the metal i could only play power chords and then i started learning to play like open chords and just kind of expanded but yeah by the time we were like like all that stuff was blending together, and by the time we were listening to, I mean, when we were like recording as Joe Christmas, it was lots of indie rock and yeah, like punk, like constantly listening to punk rock and yeah. like MXPX and uh, Lagwagon and No Effects, yeah, and um, all of the Fat Records stuff, and then old stuff from the seventies, and then like being really into like drag city records and yeah. uh like bonnie prince billy palace music and like I, but i still would say that like the christian band breakfast with amy oh my gosh and you're speaking my language man and, and like the, the offshoots from that band like plague of ethels and fluffy like that stuff and then michael knott and all the lifesavers albums yeah. and and the choir, and then Sebado and Pavement, and Sonic Youth, and uh, uh, um, uh, so I always say Sebado and Pavement because, like, I guess those were like the the biggest influences. And then Dinosaur Junior, of course. I start. Yeah. I heard of, like some Neil Young when I got to college, but I, was, I always liked the stuff that was louder and heavier. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then. It's it's crazy, like what you know. All the bands are talking about the Throws, Michael Knott, Breakfast with Amy, Plague of Ethel's. Oh my god! It's like there's a I don't I think there's a lot of people that have no knowledge that even building up to Tooth and Nail, there was like legit, real artistic Christian. You know, call it Christian music, music, whatever. But Christians making music that was just right. I mean, it it was it was right up there with all the other good music out there, you know, because it's so easy to see Christian music in this separate category. And that tag is well-deserved because it does sound different, but 
you know, Tooth and Nail comes along and kind of dispels that notion of, no, there's a lot of legit artists making legit music. But before that, all these bands you named, I mean, my gosh, Breakfast with Amy, that's an unbelievable band. I mean, they were just so good. Like when you guys were, uh, I guess, in the early stages of Joe Christmas, did y'all have like a internal evangelical side of, yeah, you know, we're playing music, but this is for God's glory. And I, I, I'm talking like I'm mimicking that. <laughs> I don't mean to mimic it uh, at all. Uh, I was, I was there and I understand the place for that and where people are coming from. Um, but did y'all have that sort of an edge? Like we're doing this for Jesus or was it total, like we're punk rock, we're, you know, playing our noisy shit and loving every second of it. I mean, what was kind of y'all's, mental approach to music and playing shows and all that i was definitely in the latter yeah, i mean yeah. there was no um evangelical slant to it at all and i right, remember right. like when we like when we played as crayon and we really started to get out we played with christian bands because that was the scene we grew up in right right and people right. were getting people were getting upset with us because of our ant our antics like <laughs> one one show like Zachary wore uh or spandex tights and like stuffed them with these plastic balls so it's like crotch was had this huge bulge and like <laughs> we used to one time we we dressed in like full drag but it, yeah. it was like really like nerdy drag you know yeah. and then and uh we just did all this stuff and we we really wanted to have a show and be fun right. and people people got upset and they were like you guys are are really like uh really blaspheming this guy one time at this festival called inner seeds in yeah. the summer of 94 this guy jumped on stage and told zach that god told him to tell to tell us to stop playing but, whoa, 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 whoa. and uh and it was just like it was just like you know crazy stuff like that happened and yeah. so we had no interest in trying to like uh proselytize it at like all yeah. you know and so it was just like to play because we loved playing music and we wanted to be in a band and that was it yeah i love that and and i think my earlier comments you know at, i definitely sounded like a, a a geek saying it but like there was it, that was noticeable so what you described i'm not sure if the listeners would describe it in the same way but like I, and i'm not saying that bands that are openly evangel you know evangelistic are not authentic I'm not saying that i'm saying you know but a lot of them it does come across as not that authentic and i think that's what was so noticeable about joe christmas and why it was so cool that, oh my gosh, and, and these guys, you know, so in my perspective, it was like, oh my gosh, and these guys are Christians? This is so cool. I mean, they're not trying to, you know, fit Jesus in every song. They're singing about Rocky II, my favorite movie series, and, you know, just, and and just the the feel of just that punk rock attitude. Um, now, hearing what was behind the scenes and the fact that you guys weren't trying to, to be anything other than enjoy playing music, I think that is what was so noticeable from a listener experience. And and I do want to say this, you know, if 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 guys like you that, you know, were in a tooth and nail band that dropped an album or two or or whatever, you guys were part of a very, very special, special time. I mean, you know, there there's hundreds of thousands of of guys now and they're you know, women and men in their mid thirties to, uh, mid forties or whatever. And I mean, we look back on this era of music as man, that was such a special time. I mean, so many people, like I, I talk about my experiences of going to my college mailbox and being so excited to pull that tooth and nail package out. So many other people say the same sort of stuff or going through the tooth and nail catalogs and seeing all the CDs and all the different shirts and, you know, turning in a Christmas list and all that stuff. So just you know, sir, you were part of something extremely special, in my opinion, uh, in one of the more important bands in that era. All right, so 
tooth and nail, you so you guys, how did how did y'all make the agreement? I mean, did y'all end up sending them a demo, or uh, did the luxury guys turn in a demo to Brandon? Like, how how did y'all uh, sign the dotted line? Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to answer that part. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you went on good tangents. <laughs> no, we um, were signed to a label called Flying Tart Records. Yeah, yeah, I've heard, I've of, heard that. of that. Yeah, they. Uh, that was owned by a guy named Alex Parker, and he had seen the uh, infamous performance at Interseed where, you know, the guy told us we needed to stop playing. And uh, <laughs> and then, so, he wanted to sign us, and we, we said yes, and then we went to Nashville and recorded our record in February of 95, and then he uh, sent a copy of it to Brandon, and um, so allegedly he sent a note that said, ha ha ha, look what I have that you don't. And um, <laughs> he was in the, t in the uh, tooth and nail office listening to it. And Evan Haas from Blenderhead was there. Yeah, and yeah. E Evan said, this is really cool. You need to get it. And yeah, so yeah. Brandon agreed and he, <laughs> um, he, uh, contacted alex and said he wanted to buy the contract and the album and so we said we'll do it and that's that yeah oh, kind that's, of a weird so cool man but that's the that's the story as it was told to me yeah, <laughs> yeah. are are, are y'all you know when and obviously we're, we're you know we're reminiscing but this is a long time ago but now looking back on it do you like the decision to sign with Tooth and Nail? Like, are you glad that those two full lengths are now resting on Tooth and Nail records? Like, was that a good thing for y'all's short duration of a band? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Def definitely. Especially looking back, like, even though over the years, I, there have been points when I regretted it and I've been like, oh, why couldn't we have been on another label? But, you know, now that everything is kind of settled, I'm really grateful and especially, it's really nice to have to see the label having such longevity. Yeah, yeah. And and all of our music has stayed out there, like all the the early bands. Because I think we were inside the first fifty releases. I think. Yeah, yeah, those, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. sure. Pretty sure. So, um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's really, it's really amazing. It's, it's just I didn't. Well, of course, like you can't see the future, but it's not something. I expected, you know, although like I always hoped to achieve some sort of longevity, you know? Yeah. 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 Have y'all ever, like when y'all see Jay Mascus and I mean, D Dinosaur Jr. as a band and I mean, Guided by Voices, are still putting out albums and stuff. Do you ever get an itch thinking, man, we just, let's get back together and do Joe Christmas one more time? Oh yeah. Especially yeah, yeah. since like I have a bunch of like half, finished songs just sitting around and <laughs> i i was it's weird like i was even thinking about it this morning while i was out walking our dog like yeah I yeah would love to see like what the four of us could do with with this unfinished stuff like we even have stuff from that we were working on for a third record that just never got finished it's been just like in, in limbo since 97 so <laughs> That's unreal. Dude, and it's so crazy too because like there I mean this we are now living in a season where people are craving that sort of sort of nostalgia. And so I mean pretty much here's here's the market that you will have. You will have every single person who ever enjoyed uh Joe Christmas from listening to the albums over and over like my brother and I to just seeing the video to couple skate to but Joe Christmas comes out with a third album and it's like it will for sure have some measure of success just because everybody and but then on add on top of that it would be really good stuff that would you know probably even because of the internet expand y'all's listenership so I'm a big fan of the idea man big fan <laughs> um do you have uh and, and these are the kind of questions that my friends give me hell for but hey I'm a music fan I'm not you know I'm not in a band but do you have uh, a favorite album out of the two Joe Christmases? Yeah, I like, I prefer Upstairs Overlooking just yeah, because yeah. that's the, like 
where I am now, that's the kind of music that I prefer to listen to just because right, it's, right. it's louder and it, it's more energetic and it, yep, yep. it has a couple of heavy moments on it. But I don't, because yep, yep. ever since I got sober a few years ago, I, I stopped listening to um, the kind of like quiet uh, right, like right. indie stuff, you know, I just don't have any patience. I just want to <laughs> rock, you know. And, like, I mean, I, I I enjoy like ambient, like drone stuff still, but that really takes you off into like a an otherworldly headspace, you know. Yeah, yeah, yep, but, you yep. know this stuff that's like quiet. Like I remember, like we used to like get really high and listen to a band like Lamb Chop or oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, they're a good example. Just something yeah, that's yeah. soft and kind of sing songy, and yeah, even yeah. like Mercury Rev. Like I can't really listen to that anymore, you know. And right, right. Like Marco Horse or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. too. But but I so I like. But I also like the. Uh, I have such good memories of the making the first record too and it was just a really pure experience i mean the second making north to the future was really special in its own way but um just as far as albums go i i like the first one better yeah 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 for sure now what was what 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 did the writing process typically look like for these albums i mean did someone come up would you come up with a guitar lick and then give it to someone who crafted the song or you just how, how did that look like what's a snapshot of how joe christmas came up with songs oh a lot of it just happened like in the practice room yeah, i remember yeah. um like <laughs> when we came up with scrabble girl i was just sitting there playing the bass and i just played the you know the the bass line i just played it and yeah, it, yeah. and then Zach was there and he went doo, 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 yeah, doo, yeah. on the guitar and then yeah, yeah. It seems like we put the whole thing together in like 10 minutes you know and then uh there was that song like a song like baby shoes like i wrote the whole thing by myself and then the band like kind of reformed it and every, you know everyone put their own touches on it you know and then uh like with both albums we went to the studio with a few songs that were com- that were totally complete and then some songs that were only partially complete right right and uh like you know did you know there's three different drummers on upstairs overlooking mm-hmm. i did not yeah. Know. yeah well the song about rocky slick chicken that's from our the oatmeal demo that we recorded before upstairs overlooking yeah, and yeah. so J- Jason Dempsey plays drums on that, and then um, we had like bedrooms, bedroom suite, and yeah, yeah. Uh, yellow umbrella. Steve Hindelong from the choir plays drums on those. Did he really? I was gonna ask because I knew he was one of the producers. Yeah, yeah, because those songs weren't finished. And we went to the studio, and Chris Colbert and Steve Hindelong helped us finish them. I mean, we had all the riffs and stuff. We just they needed arrangements. Right, and with right. the blue, the blue rider, that was a song I had written at home, but Philip had never played it on drums, so that was worked out in the studio. Yeah, but it was usually like someone would have a riff or an idea, and then we would work on it and piece it together. But Sometimes Zach would have a complete song or I would have a complete song like yeah, goodbye, yeah. goodbye and bedroom suit. Those Zach wrote those alone. And those were, he had a demo version. They were totally finished and he kind of told us what to do. and We put our own little touches on it. And then yeah, yeah. like on North, North to the future, like uh, best wishes and haunted mystery and, um, uh, Actually, I don't know if it's just those two, but he had those like, oh, the other one, Dreaming for the Gold. He had those completely worked out and yeah, yeah. arranged and everything. And then like Ryan made up a bass line and I made up my guitar part. And so that's how it went, really. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. And just when, whoever. When you... what, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Good. No, yeah, that's yeah. it pretty much. 
when you when you talk about this stuff and think back, I mean, obviously, obviously, it's a it's a you know reading your book and talking to you already on Bad Christian. I mean, it's an important part of your life. Are you at a place now, um, you know, age wise, and just having lived uh, a lot longer, you know, since then and all that? Like, what are your reflections on that? Like, does it ever turn into sadness? Like, I wish that was still here, or I wish we were still doing that, or why didn't it, you know, turn into three, four, five albums or anything like that? Or do you reflect on it with kind of a total smile on your face, man, that was awesome to be a part of that. Like what's your emotions talking about all this? Well, it used to be like total sadness and regret, you know, yep, and I yep. would just be like, Oh, why did I fuck that up? You know, right, why right. can't I go back and do it right? But like now, um, there's been a lot of healing over the last couple of years. And yeah, yeah. especially here lately was like putting that book out and stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. um, and tell people the title real quick and every, everything. It's a wonderful book, but you know we're not talking about it much, but plug it for us. Okay. It's called um, Heroin is the Answer, a memoir of what I can remember. And uh, it's my first nonfiction narrative. It's 40 chapters with 40 corresponding poems. And the poems were written from the mid to late 80s, 90s. <laughs> That uh, when I was in active, you know, drinking and drugging and uh, using. And the prose was written recently as a sober reflection on all that stuff. Yeah, it's wonderful. It really is. It's it's such it's such a good read, even if you're not familiar. You know, I, I read it enjoying the story. I mean, it's heart-wrenching, but enjoying your story and also knowing, oh, yeah, this guy plays in a band that I really enjoy, too. But even even if you don't care about the music part, you're just a really, really talented writer. I hope that that's something that you keep trying to do because I would, I'd cut my right ar- arm off to be able to write that well, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So what, uh, what happened? You know, you guys have a third album uh, or like some material that you're batting around for a third album. Why, why didn't that happen? Um, Well, uh, I guess it was just because we just never like got it together. We kind of just ground to a halt, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I remember that we were arguing about whether or not to go on tour and like, Ryan and I lived right outside of Atlanta and Zach and Philip lived in Athens and practices were kind of sporadic and kind yeah, of yeah. difficult. And uh, one night Zach and I were talking on the phone and he was just like, you know, I feel like I'm in a relationship that, that like with a girl that, and a, that it's miserable and we're about to break up. And I was like, yeah, me too. And we, we just like felt like we were just – um, forcing ourselves to keep it going, and yeah, yeah. Um, I I wish we had just I do wish <clears throat> you know we had said let's take some time off and see how we feel, but we just decided to call it. You know we we're like hey let's let's just forget it and we'll do something else. And uh, so <clears throat> we had a band meeting and every we just kind of like. We just talked it over, and there was a group consensus just to stop, you know, just yeah, to go yeah. ahead and call it a day. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah, is, gosh. I don't know. It just seems kind of weird because, like, um, looking back, it doesn't seem like it was that bad or, you know, we were just kind of going through a rough patch. But Right, right. Well, you're also operating with a 20-some-year-old brain. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you just didn't you didn't process things as you process them now. So yeah, I I can imagine. I bet you we could trace a, a lot of decisions that we would do differently now, <laughs> for sure, for sure. What are you know? We'll wrap this up in a second. But what do you have any? You mentioned the guys in Luxury. Were there any other bands that you went on tour with that really formed a, a bond with or just you know any cool dudes you're like man i love such and such went on tour you know just stories of interesting people on tooth and nail or any fun tours that stand out in your mind or anything like that 
Oh, well, uh, we got to, we stayed at the Roadside Monument House in Seattle and man, loved those guys. And they were like a real joy to hang out with, you know, and um, Jonathan Ford, you know, from Roadside Monument and Unwed yeah. Sailor. He's an awesome dude. Like he's still one of my all time favorite people, you know, and um, I, we uh, got to play with MXPX a few times. We played yeah, yeah. with them in Connecticut, and uh, then um, I think it was, I forgot when, what tour it was, but um, when I was living back at my parents' house, they they stayed, like 90 Pound Wuss and MXPX were touring together, and they stayed at our house. Nice. And my, my mom cooked pancakes for everybody in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> It was really sweet. Yeah. And, um, yeah, those guys were uh, really awesome and definitely like, really like, uh, like Jeff from 90 Pound Wars. He yeah, was yeah. like, really cool guy. And, um, uh, that's cool. Yeah. I've, I've met, I've met a lot of those guys, uh, in, in recent years, uh, Jeff being one of them, he's super, super cool guy. And Matt Johnson and roadside monument never met Jonathan Ford, but, uh, Matt Johnson, I, I don't know if he was the guitarist of roadside monument or yeah. yeah that yeah. guy was rad too. Yeah. 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 So Joe Christmas now, are you guys, um, you know, do any of y'all go to church regularly? Is spirituality an important thing in your life? Are y'all kind of all over the map or do y'all even talk about it? What's, you know, what's faith play? Uh, I feel like I have a good feel for you just because of our emails and reading your book and all that stuff. But other people that are interested, like how are y'all processing spirituality? Well, I know that Ryan is a member of the Eastern Orthodox church now. And, um, that's summer in Decatur, and uh, I don't know too much about them except uh, it's Orthodox. I mean, I guess that's yeah, yeah. like a more literal right, um, right. interpretation of the scripture and stuff. And uh, so I know he's active in that congregation. Um, and you know, Philip, like, is kind of like a uh, He's a spiritual person, but I don't think he's involved yep, in yep. any particular faith. And then the same for Zach, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, so, yeah, and then um, well, you know about me. Did you want me to say anything about that? But, Go for it. Yeah. I mean, I'm involved in uh, twelve step. Um, yeah, yeah. Living, I guess you could say twelve stepping. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. That pretty much um, informs my spirituality yeah, yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting when we when we look back on the the world that we were living in. You know, back in the mid late nineties, young punk Christian kids trying to figure stuff out, and now as we see the world differently, it's so easy to see that narrow, tiny, tiny little hole that we were looking through that such a small percentage of people on this world were looking through that same tiny, tiny little hole that, at least for me, wreaked havoc on my life of legalism and guilt and shame and just all of that stuff that, you know, I say I'm still working out of it, but I'd say, you know, hopefully most of the job's done, but it's just, it's, it's just so interesting to, to think of that time of awesome birthing of wonderful music but then at the same time we were a lot of us were locked into that religiosity that we needed to work out of yeah yeah that was when i you know i started coming out of it and uh but yeah it, it was i'm thankful for the spiritual foundation that it gave me yeah but at the same time i do think that um you know, being raised in that environment, like, uh, produced a lot of unnecessary guilt. And yeah. um, it is it is difficult to process. I mean, guilt just being one of the things, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah so for sure. We could go on for days about that. but <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Well, Russell, this has been awesome getting a uh, behind-the-scenes look at a very important band to me personally so i certainly appreciate your time man it's been fun 
Cool. Thank you so much for having me. That's been awesome.